I'm Scott Lucas. This is World Unfiltered. Headlines in recent weeks, at least in the Western press, and possibly a few inside Russia, have been focused on the N-word, Alexei Navalny. Alexei Navalny, as you no doubt know by now, is a leader, not the only leader, but a leader of the Russian opposition. He happens to be one whom many suspect, myself included, the Russian state had tried to kill on several occasions, including last year. He is now serving two years and eight months in prison. There were at least two sets of protests that followed this. They have now been suspended until the spring. So that raises the question for me as others continue to talk about Navalny versus Putin, almost like uh, you know the all Russia remake of Rocky IV. How do we actually go beyond the issues that are very important about one of the most influential countries in the world who is too often represented as the former Soviet superpower and now the struggling post-Russia power trying to find its way in the world in whatever aggressive Putinist manner it can find. Well, to dig into these questions, not just about the current situation inside Russia, but about the wider implications for Russia in the world now and in the future, I wanted to turn to Mark Galeati. I followed Mark Galeati's work for a long time. He is an honorary professor at the School of Slavonic and Eastern European Studies in London. He is a senior associate fellow at the Royal United Services Institute. He's been a professor at New York University. And he's also been a visiting professor at the Moscow State Institute of International Relations in Moscow, a living example of how one man tries to negotiate between the United States and the Soviet Union stroke Russia. Perhaps more importantly, even than those things for me right now is that Mark has a podcast called In Moscow Shadows, which I highly recommend, which is sort of a guide to getting us beyond the immediate headlines into some of the questions we're gonna talk about today. Mark, welcome to World Unfiltered. Great to be here. I wanted to start, if I may, with your most recent podcast, um, because I was really struck by the approach you took to get us beyond immediate events to talk about the possibility that far from being a sign of the weakness of whatever you want to call it, the state, the system, the regime, Vladimir Putin itself, that the Navalny effect might be a potion to sustain late Putinism. What does that mean? Well, in a way, I started from the premise that there's a lot of discussion about, oh, my God, Russia is now descending into fascism and so forth, which it's not. But also an implicit assumption is that Putin and his security apparatus and his cronies, who, let's be absolutely clear, are on the, in the main unpleasant kleptocrats, but nonetheless, that they almost were looking for an excuse to be able to crack down and send out the riot police and such like. And the answer is, look, clearly they don't. Clearly, if they'd wanted that, they didn't need an excuse. Instead, this is essentially a bunch of, I would suggest, sort of quite worried old men. People who, because of their experiences, I mean, whether it's in terms of Putin himself when East Germany collapsed, or just generally what happened in the Soviet Union, have a pretty visceral fear of protests on the streets and how that can lead to state collapse and so forth. Their response is one in which they're trying to calibrate what they would regard as the necessary levels of violence, but not any more than that. They really don't want to be fighting a war with their own population. And what we've seen in the past has been that actually what can happen in these circumstances is it, it poses a pretty existential challenge to regimes, not just Russians. But well, okay, do you just muddle on as usual and hope that things work out, or at least just long, long enough for you to have died or left the country or whatever? Do you precisely crack down? At which point it reaches a stage where it's an irreversible process. You can't just say, you know, sorry, sorry that, that we imprisoned your grandmother and sorry that we broke your son's kneecaps, but let's, you know, let bygones be bygones. No, after a certain point, you are locked into that process, which also means that you are therefore become dependent on the security apparatus, on the generals. Or the third option is that what smart conservatives do is they realize that they need to bring about some kind of reform, sufficient reform to renovate the system, but under their control so that they still maintain their, their status. 
Now, that's a very, very difficult thing to manage, and I'm not entirely sure that Putin and co have got what it takes. But there have been examples, and the, the example I use is of Prime Minister Stalipin, who from 1905 onwards was involved in this twin track approach of violently suppressing uprisings, while at the same time trying genuinely to thoroughly renovate the system. Well, it might be that we'll, we will see some kind of study pin effect taking place in, in Putin's Russia. I, I mean, I'm not entirely sure, but what I was trying to get away from is this rather sterile debate about whether or not, is this the end of Putinism or is this Russia descending into full on authoritarianism? It's actually a lot more complex than that. It, let me just follow up on one thing there, which is okay, so, so the possibility of reforms, but this is not the strongest economy right now as we've seen for some time. I'm not sure there's scope for fundamental change of the system. So what do you mean by reforms that could be taken in the near future in response to what has been seen in recent weeks as this challenge to the system? Well, interestingly, there are still some really quite surprising strengths to the Russian economy. I mean, first of all, they basically have massive reserves. They built up this rainy day fund, which, which really is very, very impressive. Secondly, they have already identified many of the key things that need to be done from building up infrastructure to actually renovating the, the legal system so that entrepreneurs and, and investors feel they have protection. I mean, the irony, or in some ways the tragedy, is actually it's not as though people are looking around for some desperate search for the magic bullets that, will, that may help them. We know what Russia needs. The Russian government knows what it needs. The problems are political. They're precisely about, okay, addressing the industrial scale kleptocratic corruption at the very top of the system, which drains a phenomenal amount of, of energy and resource. Secondly, dealing precisely with rule of law. You, know, you have courts, which is a lot of people who actually just want to follow the law. You have police, most of whom just want to be cops. And yet they're constantly being put in positions in which they're having to either impose dictats of the state or just being sort of essentially having the law turned into something that is up there for up for auction, in effect. You know, it is a question of political will rather than economic resources. I'm not saying that, that Russia will, will become Germany in five years, of course not. But actually, the scope for the people to feel that there are, things are moving in the right direction, I think that's crucial. It's, it's actually people's sense of the direction of travel. That really wouldn't take very much if and only if the guy at the center is willing to take that move, which will inevitably mean that some of his cronies, they might lose one or two billion of the many billion that they've already stolen from the Russian people. I want to pick up on that and go very wide on that, but I, I guess because of events, I do need to come back to the Navalny issue in a sense, just for some basic explanation, because for me, as with so many things about Russia, the current 21st century information disinformation space means you pay your money, you take your choice. So Alexei Navalny, as a liberal, who's this necessary corrective to decades of Soviet and Russian authoritarianism oppression, or you say Alexei Navalny, far-right nationalist, political opportunist, racist, bigot, et cetera. For you, when you analyzed, who is Alexei Navalny and what is the significance here? That's a really good point because this is it. There, uh there is this challenge of trying to identify who Navalny is. And, and let's be clear, I mean, this is a man not without ego, show me a political leader who, who isn't, but especially one that's actually willing to challenge uh, a vicious and entrenched state. Who has the necessary, well, one could call it opportunism or one could call it capacity to grow, but in any way whose views do absolutely change over time. This is not a man who has a kind of, some kind of rigid dogma there is no Navalnyism. What there is are certain, I would suggest, certain kind of fundamental beliefs, which are essentially that uh, you know about corruption being the greatest scourge on the Russian people at the moment, on the need for rule of law as the sort of most fundamental instrument to deal with it, but also to deal with so many of the other sort of challenges that are facing Russia today, and the need for democracy, the need for some kind of real democracy so that there are choices. Now, Navalny himself, I mean, yes, in the past, certainly he, he made some, what to Western ears are quite offensively racist comments. It's worth saying that by Russian standards, it's pretty mainstream. And perversely, 
I would suggest this is actually in some ways a political advantage. Navalny is just racist enough so that to ordinary Russians, he seems like one of them. I mean, you know, we have to re realize that if he came totally sort of um, imbued with Western style identity politics and so forth, he would seem like he had just descended from Mars as far as most Russians, especially outside Moscow and a handful of the other major cities would be. No, I mean, th this is a man who's still within kind of the Russian social mainstream. The man who absolutely was supportive of the annexation of Crimea, like almost all Russians regarding it as a historic wrong righted was quite supportive of the war, the reef war that was fought against Georgia. But on the other hand, has also said that he would pull Russian forces and, and Russian intervention out of the Donbass in southeastern Ukraine. So, you know, he's not an unthinking knee-jerk nationalist of the anyone on our borders gets to be invaded if we feel like it variety. But on the other hand, nor is he apologetic about Russia and Russian national interests. But the point is, in some ways, I would suggest that none of this matters. We're not putting him up for beatification. We're not even really about having a conversation about whether he is the right president or prime minister for Russia. I mean, he himself says, look, that, that's another debate that we've got to have. First, we have to have real elections. Then we can actually argue as to who would be the best candidate for that position. And I think this is, this is what's so crucial about Navalny, is at present, he is the embodiment of this general Russian drive for something different. Um, some sense of a, of, a, of a change from the status quo. And when you had the, the tens of thousands, over 100,000 people coming out for protests, most of them were not coming out for Navalny. Some of them didn't really know who he was particularly. Some of them, maybe, yes, they, they were horrified by the fact that the state had tried to assassinate him. But above all, they were coming out for a variety of reasons of their own, often local reasons, which all in some ways kind of come into that general sense of just, we're fed up. I mean, I call this the coalition of the fed up that we're not happy with the way things are going. We're not happy with the way the system is working or not working in terms of allowing our voice to be heard. And so when Navalny comes along, he becomes this sort of the catalyst for something that, that's much, much wider. And in that respect, I think that is in, in a way his greatest at the moment triumph as well as politically a problem for him. How does he turn that kind of loose support into actual real committed um, constituencies? But nonetheless, I think this is why I think we have to understand that Navalny is much less important. And it seems awful to say it because at the moment we have this whole kind of debate about whether he's a, he's a saint or a devil. But the point is, in a way, what he is, is much, much less important than what he means in the system. And that brings me to a question I'm wrestling with here, which is, you know, it, when we talk about opposition, it may not be that there is a single coherent opposition movement. People may have grievances across the spectrum, depending on whether they're in the cities, outside the cities, economic, political. I mean, is there a possibility of bringing together those different strands of opposition, or is it always dependent on some figurehead who's going to be able to speak to all of them, at least at a particular moment in time? Yeah, I mean, this has actually been a problem for Russian opposition movement for, for some time, even sort of before Navalny was really a sort of a fixture. In part, it's because of the, the egos and factionalism at work. And in part, it's precisely because people have very different prescriptions for what Russia needs. And again, I think this is why it's important for Navalny to focus on the immediate process, which is we need to have elections, rather than, and this is my program for how we make a better Russia. Because if you look at the current opposition, I mean, it absolutely crosses the spectrum. We have still quite a you know, small but, but quite vibrant left, which has struggled against the fact that in some ways that the language of the left became pretty toxic, given the extent to which in the Soviet Union, the Communist Party talked left and, and frankly acted right. So you have that, you have the so-called systemic opposition of the kind of official and largely fake opposition parties that were set up within the system, which include the communists, the liberal democrat party, who are neither liberal nor democrat, and, and various others that are more, more bit part ones, which were not intended to be real opposition parties. And their leaders, frankly, do not have any aspiration to be genuine opposition leaders, but within which there are those who actually say, no, we need to have change. And then there's even actually an extreme nationalist and, and rightist opposition movement. I mean, I think this is, this is one, in some ways for me, one of the sort of more fascinating areas. You have people like Igor Girkin, known as Strelkov, who was this sort of 
one of the key combatants in Crimea, but to a much greater extent, the Donbass wars, who was then sort of yanked out by Russia because he was just too extreme for them. And you know, the, the, his particular movement, I mean, they believe that Putin basically abandoned Russian self-interest for his own benefit. And they think that he sold out Russia. I mean, you know, we may think Putin's pretty extreme, but as far as they're concerned, he's not extreme enough. But again, the interesting thing is their view is he could do this because there are no checks and balances on the, in the system because he basically can do whatever he wants. And so ironically, these frankly often quite vicious and xenophobic ultranationalists, their prescription for Russia includes, guess what? Rule of law, independent courts, democratic votes, because as far as they're concerned, if we had that, ordinary Russians will be backing us. So on the one hand, there is this huge range of opinion, but the interesting thing is, and this is how it's, I think sort of, it, it, it's gonna work if it's gonna work at all, is the one thing they do all agree on is that the current status quo is a corrupt oligarchic kleptocracy, which has a fake democratic system. And what they need to do is break its control over the, over the political process. If you have real elections, they're all convinced that the Russian people will see the logic of their own particular platforms, whether we're talking about communists or whether we're talking about ultranationalists. That's fine. Anyway, that, that can be the next grand, grand battle that they, they can work out the, between them just as it does in every democratic country. But there is this growing, I would suggest, consensus of the need to break the power of the oligarchy. It, which raises this question of the battle, the contest for the system and its processes. But of course, we had a series of measures that were taken last year by the Kremlin. You know, their changes to the system, including bringing in a state council, the question of the position of the, uh, the former president, Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev, and all of this. You characterize in your recent podcast that those attempts at changes, I hesitate to call them reforms, given whoever's interest they're in, have been somewhat staggering in their effect. I, I guess I have a couple of questions here. First is, were those changes meant to secure Putin or to secure Russia after Putin? And if they have been staggering or stumbling in their you know, success, why has that been? Well, again, I think the issue here is there is the real intent and then there is the avowed intent. Now, I think the real intent was essentially to, start to protect Putin and his control over the system, you know, the key element of the constitutional changes essentially allows him to zero his terms for the purpose of term limits, so that when he stands in 2024, he can still stand for two more now six year terms and in theory, be president until 2036. Now, I have no belief that he actually wants to do that. I think already he's tired and bored. But for the year before, the question of succession the question of who would come after Putin had become the sort of the dominant obsession of not just the Moscow chattering classes, but also the political elite. And therefore, what I think had happened is this was seen as becoming counterproductive. And it was his way of almost indicating, look, I will step down when I'm good and ready, but there is no vacancy for now. There is no vacancy in the immediate future. So stop it. But the point is, he couldn't actually say that as, as, as his goal. So actually, you, you know, you, you, you have an avowed intent that is much more about sort of bringing the constitution in line with the needs of Russia today, yada, yada, yada. But no one really understood what the hell any of that meant. And the problem was that, you know, in a way, Putin, he knew what he wanted in, in broad terms, but he didn't have a detailed notion. He he's not a details guy. And so what happened is we ended up having a, a debate that in due course ran into, like everything else, COVID. And in some ways, everything got, got consumed by, by COVID. So an, an opportunity to really reconceptualize what the Russian state was about got lost between the lack of any real plan from, from above and the fact that COVID had suddenly sort of consumed all, all attention. So this was in many ways a wasted opportunity. I mean, sure, it means Putin is in power for as long as he wants, but beyond that, I think, it was, it was a chance for a national debate, but when it came down to it, the Kremlin fears debate, and therefore it didn't really get, ever get off the ground. I mean, critics of Putin, perhaps unjustly, have said, well, he's a master tact tactician, but he's not a master strategist. So I'm struck by your description of what happened last year, and I'm struck by the question about the fact that you do have room for short-term economic measures 
to deal with the immediate issues that have arisen. But is there a medium to long-term vision that is coming out from Putin or elsewhere for Russian stability, both economically and politically? I don't think so. I mean, what we have are these things called the, the, the national projects, so this sort of series of big, major sort of thrust for everything from infrastructural development to um, you know, e ecological movement and so forth, which is what Kremlin spokespeople always default to when they're asked about national vision. And the interesting thing is, look, actually a national vision is not about whether or not you're going to be building more highways or whether or not you're going to diversify the, the economy away from hydrocarbons. That's part of it, to be sure but it's not really what the vision thing is about. And again, I mean, when it comes back to it, I mean, actually one of the reasons why Navalny would be so dangerous and one of the reasons why the Kremlin is so keen to silence him and shut him away and keep him off the media is in a way, Navalny can articulate a big vision for Russia, but doesn't have a kind of detailed program of how we get there. Putin can give you, well, Putin's people can give you the detailed program but when you ask what the grand vision is, once you get beyond bromides about, you know, a, a great, prosperous and happy Russia, fine, OK, but they don't have anything more than that. And I think this is this is one of, of, of the real problems. I mean, Putin, let's be honest, he, he's getting older. Well, we all are. But the point is, he's been in power for 20 years, which, frankly, is longer than anyone ought to be in power. In that time, his circle has shrunk of the people he listens to. And they're now very much more people who just simply echo back to him comforting reassurances rather than actually ever seek to challenge his, his, his ideas and so forth. Um, his notion of quite what Russia needs is very different. You know, the initial Putin, Putin 20 years ago was actually strikingly pragmatic. He talked tough about Russia and he obviously would defend national interest. You know, he is in his own way a patriot, however difficult it is to square that with overseeing the mass embezzlement from your own country. But nonetheless, somewhere in his mind, he's managed to, to reconcile those two. But nonetheless, you know, for all that, he, he believed in engagement with the outside world. He believed in developing some kind of a relationship with the West. He believed also in the idea that somehow he could get the Russian people behind him. It's not as if it was from the, from the word go, all about manipulation and control and if need be force. Over time though, like so many leaders or particularly authoritarian leaders, he has become a caricature of himself. You know, exactly, I think, you know, all, all, all the nuance has been bled away. All the opposition notions have been removed. I would be fascinated, for example, to read the briefings that he gets. I don't even know how many of the problems facing Russia he genuinely knows about because he doesn't even travel, even before COVID, he didn't really travel the country in the way that he once did. So I think increasingly he is, insulated from, from the real world. And as a result, not only can he not articulate a vision, he may well not even realize that he needs to articulate a vision. That, that leads maybe to, if I try to connect the domestic with what is happening outside of Russia. I mean, and again, in this era of disinformation, what Russia has done, has been doing, we'll get into trouble here, but let me take a stab at it. We have seen on the one hand, Russia, let us say, be much more forth, especially I think after its fears with the fall of President Yanukovych in Ukraine in 2014. You've mentioned the annexation of the Crimea, the encouragement of schism in Eastern Ukraine, but we've also seen Russia with its intervention in Syria, in the Middle East. We've seen its nation system or disinformation system, if you will, pursue various activities. We've seen the interventions in elections, including in the US election in 2016. Is there a vision behind those Russian activities abroad or should we see this merely as a reaction to what is happening inside the country in a sense of we can project strength. We've got to project strength precisely so people inside as well as outside Russia don't believe we're weak. Yeah, it's interesting that, that notion about, about weakness. Um, yesterday I was giving a, an online lecture to a couple of hundred British army officers, well, various army officers. Um, and one of the things I was, I was trying to hammer home was precisely that you, know, you are worried about the Russians. Trust me, the Russians are worried about you. Um, and again, this, this is a sort of a classic trope. One can go back to the Cold War. We are always aware of our own weaknesses and the other side always looks three meters tall. Well, 
Likewise, the world look from the Kremlin windows looks quite a scary place. And in particular, look, Putin is, is convinced in a way that Russia has great power status as its birthright because it's a great power. Um, and in part, look, this is because he is in that sort of true last homo sovieticus generation, that generation of people who went, they weren't just educated in Soviet times, but had their early formative career there and who had to ha still having to cope with the trauma of literally overnight changing from being a citizen of one of the two global superpowers to being citizen in this ramshackle thing called the Russian Federation that's in chaos and anarchy and no one really knows you know, what it's for. And I mean, let's be perfectly honest, you know, from, from the point of view uh, as a Brit, has Britain really got over losing its empire? Has France really got over losing its empire? I would suggest not really. And that's given a lot more time in far better conditions. So, you know, there is a lot of this is post-imperial trauma, but also Putin's notion of what a great power is, is quite aggressive. It's quite 19th century, frankly. Mm. You know, great power has a sphere of influence. Other countries whose sovereignty are subordinated to the metropolis. Great power has a voice in, everything that goes on in the world, not just things that have direct relevance to that. So, you know, if you're gonna resolve any big issue, Russia must have a seat at the table and Russia's interests must be considered. And if you don't get Russia in, it's our job to make sure that you can't resolve the issue. And thirdly and finally, a great power gets to break the rules from time to time and get away with it. Now, all of these is because as far as Putin is concerned, America has got those. We can debate whether or not America really does, but that doesn't matter. Putin and those around him believe that that's what a great power has. We are trying to deny Russia that status. We are not acknowledging that, for example, Ukraine falls within Russia's sphere of influence and therefore, of course, Moscow should be able to tell the Ukrainians what to do. Now, I'm not saying we should, but I'm saying, you know, inevitably this, this, this will collide. And so as far as they're concerned, we are the aggressors. We are the ones trying to unfairly undermine, constrain, diminish and marginalize Russia. And therefore they have to push back against our hybrid war, as they call it. They, they, they think all these things that we accuse them of doing, they, I think genuinely believe wrongly, but nonetheless they believe we are doing to them. Now in that context, and this is a very long answer, but, but I think one, it helps explain something about the mindset at work. When one looks at places like Syria, or Libya, or Venezuela, or elsewhere that they get involved, it is often precisely because they feel they have to push back. They feel they need to demonstrate that Russia is not a marginal country. They feel they need to acquire bargaining chips, so that because as far as they're concerned, we the West will only take Russia seriously when Russia forces us to. And it has to be said, we have often dramatically mishandled our relationship with Russia and actually contributed to that sense, because it's true. You know, when, when the Russians went into Syria uh, with a relatively small, but actually very effective deployment, suddenly the Russians became significant. And interestingly, I mean, that happened, and there's a whole variety of reasons why it happened, but it happened just at the time when America in particular was trying to marginalize Russia, was basically to freeze it out of the global diplomatic arena. So there was this sense of, no, you don't get to do that to Russia. We will inject ourselves into an area that matters to you and force you to talk to us. And interestingly, after that deployment, it was one of the few times that Putin went to the UN General Assembly and had a meeting with Barack Obama. And there is this wonderful photo of the two of them having their meeting with Obama looking so, so deeply uncomfortable. And in some ways, from the Russians' point of view, that's the point. You didn't want to meet Putin but you had to, we made you. So a lot of it is exactly, it's about desperately trying to force us to give Russia the kind of status that it thinks it deserves. But last point I'd make is you mentioned domestically. Interestingly, ordinary Russians don't really care about this. Crimea, absolutely. Crimea, as far as they're concerned, you know, it was a piece of Russia that in the 1950s was unfairly given to Ukraine and now it's, it's back home where, where it belongs. But apart from that, no, and this is one of the reasons why the Kremlin lies. It lies about its troops in the Donbass. It lies about the level of its commitments elsewhere, not to convince us in the West, but actually to, to reassure its own people who really are not into this. Putin has been trying to re-legitimate himself through international relations. And Russians time and time again have said, look, we just want schools that are up to standard and roads that work and you know, 
an income you know, that basically isn't shrinking and hasn't been shrinking for the last decade. Give us that and we don't really care that much about great power status. That's your thing, not ours. One question before we build to a big finish. Um, these steps, tactics that Putin's taken, arguably they've been called out in certain cases, have been very successful, I think very successful in Syria. But uh, Russia has been called out, if not necessarily by Western anti-imperialist activists, by many people, other people over the 2016 interference in the US elections. They have been called out over the nerve agent attack in Southern England against a former uh, intelligence officer, Sergei Skripal and his daughter. And they have been called out now over not one, but at least two attacks on Navalny in recent years and to an extent by the arrest. Is there any sense that the Kremlin thinks it may have overreached with some of the tactics or are they willing to take some of the blowback as it were, some of the criticism, because at the end of the day, it's all part of a pattern of trying to, to keep pushing or at least to keep defending in their ideas uh, through fairly aggressive action. Yeah, I mean, I do think that we need to understand the extent to which certainly for Putin and his inner circle, they're involved in an existential struggle for Russia's place in the world. This is big. This is not just simply, you know, where foreign policy tends to be relatively marginal in most Western countries. Mm. But as far as they're concerned, this, this, this is very big. And of course, if you're in a, in a war, a political war, but nonetheless a war, you accept that you're going to lose battles. You're going to take casualties. That's just the price of doing it. So I, I think this notion that somehow that they're going to be embarrassed into changing their policy, absolutely, that, that was always a non-starter. But it doesn't mean to say that they're, they're, they're foolish, quite the opposite. If one looks in at 2016, I mean, they, they involved themselves. Again, I think it's been massively mythologized, not least because, you know, the Democrats would rather feel that in a way this was stolen than that they basically threw away the, 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 their chance of, of winning. But on the other hand, I mean, the, the Russians clearly are aware of the extent to which we had a sort of, a, there was a massive backlash in the United States. And likewise, times they try to get involved directly in elections in Europe, particularly in France and Germany. Again, actually, not only did they not get the result they wanted, but it led to a backlash. And so they learned. And so I think what's happened now is actually they've shifted. They don't tend to try and involve themselves directly in, in, in votes. Certainly there was no real evidence of any kind of sustained campaign relating to the uh, US 2020 elections. Instead, what they do is because elections by definition open up fault lines, what they do is rather they get their crowbar and they put them in those fault lines and they just give them an extra tug. They try to maximize all the various sort of distractions and diversions and divisions that, that happen in the process. So, you know, they learn lessons. They're not gonna just basically pick fights willy nilly. They do so because they think they make sense. But on the other hand, yeah, absolutely. As far as they're concerned, this, this is political war with the West and we cannot just sit back. If we sit back, we will lose. And therefore we have to go out there, but we have to be, you know, we're not as big as the West. We you know we haven't got the economy, we haven't got the soft power. So what do we have to be? Well, we have to be smarter. We have to show more will. That's how they feel that they will ultimately succeed is because they are strong of will and con conviction. And we are a bunch of flabby democracies who don't really know what we stand for. Okay, uh, I'm gonna ask an even bigger question than apocalyptic Great, existential crisis, but also a very naive question. You have spoken quite eloquently of the uncertain position of Russia going into the future. You've talked about the possibility of stagnation and decay. Who or what follows Vladimir Putin? Well, if, I mean, obviously, I'm, I'm not, I'm not going to give you a name. If, if only I did have a name. But the thing is, I don't think Putin has a name either. I mean, I think, you know, as I mentioned, I think this is a man who is who's bored and tired with the job. If he could find someone that he genuinely felt he could trust, who was efficient enough, but also loyal enough to give it, because basically Putin knows that once you step down from that position in a system like this, where is, there isn't really rule of law, where politics is so personalized, you are essentially putting your and your immediate coteries, lives and riches at risk. So although I think he'd love to, I'm not sure if he'll ever find someone who he ultimately can bring himself to genuinely trust. So it'll probably be rather that mortality will be what, what, what makes the decision. Now, immediately who replaces him? 
Putin is, of course, not Stalin. And Putinism is miles and thousands of miles away from Stalinism. But nonetheless, I am reminded of what happened when Stalin died, that precisely the, 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 the party leadership desperately, first of all, kept it secret from ordinary Soviet people while they tried to hash out amongst themselves who would replace him. And above all, they didn't want another Stalin, another Vojt, another boss. What they wanted rather was in a way someone who would be a competent chief executive, a chairman of the board, who would instead rule in their interests. So in other words, they wanted to manage a transition from autocracy to oligarchy. I suspect that is what the, the, the strong men of the Kremlin will try and do this time. So in a way, it, in some ways, it won't necessarily probably matter as much who is president, whether it's Defense Minister Shoigu, whether it's current Prime Minister Mishustin, whether it's former Prime Minister Dmitry Medvedev, they really want to make sure that there is a void um, at the heart of this system. But as I said, it won't matter. But the thing is, this oligarchy, I do not think will last. I am obscurely and unfashionably optimistic about Russia. I think there are all kinds of reasons why actually the, the overall trend is heading in the right direction. It's always gonna be two steps forward, one and a half steps back, but nonetheless, it's moving that way. We have an elite who already stolen pretty much everything that isn't nailed down, which is in a perverse way a good thing because Russia is also on the cusp of probably one of the largest intergenerational transfers of wealth the world has ever seen. As the generation that, that stole and often killed in the 1990s, is now looking to pass on its assets, its wealth, its position to a, a new generation. And they're often looking at the pampered little darlings they've raised and thinking, A, I don't want them to have to fight the way I did. And B, I don't think they could fight the way I did. So for them, actually rule of law suddenly becomes really quite appealing. Once you've stolen everything, you want the law to basically rigidify the system and protect your wealth that you've just stolen. So rule of law becomes of interest. Secondly, most of them, they didn't sign up for some ideological crusade against the West. They basically signed up for early Putinism where, you know, yeah, you, you talk nationalism, but basically the model was steal at home, bank abroad. So you take your money and you buy your, your nice, um, you know, mansion in the South of France. You send your children to British universities, you, you know, do everything you want, but you engage yourself with the global economy. Now that they see it shrinking down, I mean, Crimea and Sochi are by all accounts very nice places. That's not where they want to have to holiday for the rest of their lives. So they also have an incentive also to improve relations with the West. And frankly, we would be so desperate that actually it really wouldn't take much of a softening of Russian position for us to gratefully and delightedly give them all kinds of access to credits and funding and all the other sorts of things they want. And the final thing is there is massive potential in Russia. And yes, in part, this is about you know, the resources and the location and everything else. It's also about the human capacities involved, the human potentiality. Um, actually, the, the, there is so much more that Russia could do. And again, as I mentioned at the beginning, it wouldn't take that much to do. So I think, although I think the immediate aftermath of Putin will be an attempt to have a sort of collective Putinism, Putinism without Putin. I don't think that will last. I think actually quite quickly, we will see it first move into a realm of basically bringing in law, but not real democracy. But the point is law is the fundamental precondition for democracy. You, know, you can have rule of law without democracy. You certainly can't have democracy without rule of law. So uh, look, I mean, ultimately I'm a historian, which means I allow myself to think of it in very big chronological spans. So, I mean, I think you might say the next political generation will be the kleptocrats um, legalizing their ill-gotten gains. The political generation after that, I think will be the Democrats. So legalized theft might in the end provide stability. I like to see the sort of, you know, the, the good in everything. It's an interesting, optimistic view that I fully share. So I wanna thank you for that, that if it doesn't provide as it were the answers for the short term, it gives some possibility down the road. For now, Mark Aliati, thank you so much for taking us out of your podcast in Moscow's shadow into a bit of light. I'll let you return to the shadows for a bit while I thank 
also the team, the Deep Dive Politics team behind this broadcast. And most of all, thank you viewers for joining me in learning and in taking that out to others and seeing where it winds up. As for where you can continue to learn, well, Deep Dive Politics is on Facebook. It's on Twitter at dive underscore politics. All of our video casts are on YouTube, but you can also, if you choose, prefer just to listen to them as you commute or as you jog on podcast on Spotify. For the moment, however, let me just say, stay safe, stay sane, be decent to each other. I'm Scott Lucas, and this has been World Unfiltered. Thank you.